Congratulations on the film. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful. It's getting it's such good buzz. It, and it should. Yeah. It's so good. Yeah. I think it was like 91% on Rotten Tomatoes yeah. the other day. I was like, yeah. <laughs> it's so good. Um, when did, I mean, where did this uh, idea come from? I mean, obviously, you know, it's not like we haven't seen these kind of coming of age yeah. dramas. And it's kind of a big thing this year. But this is a really, really good one. And a lot of that has to do with the casting of your two leads. Yeah, um, they're awesome. So, um, yeah, if you can kind of give us the genesis of this project, that would be awesome. Yeah, um, well, so I had a movie last year that was at Sundance called Which Smiling. was wonderful. Oh, thank yeah. you, thank you. Um, but yeah, the, the producers, um, Spectacular and I approached me right after Sundance and said, hey, we've got this script that Scott New Center, Mike Weber, who had written cover the Days of Summer, the band right. written. Um, and I knew of them, obviously, and I knew of the novel that Tim Tharp had written because it had been nominated for the National Book Award, but I hadn't read it. And I was, you know, flattered that they came to me, but I had never um, really been interested in directing someone else's script, is that right? Um, uh, but I, I gave it a read, and it was just like one of the fastest reads I've ever had. It was a really emotional story for me. It was like strangely, I mean, it was one of the most honest pictures of adolescence, especially male adolescence, yeah. that, that, I, that I'd read. And I also could just see myself in Sutter, I mean, myself at that age. Um, you know, and so I, I met with the producers and I still had that apprehension that, well, you know, I didn't write this, so maybe they will have a different take on it. So I went in just with an incredibly specific uh, vision of what the film would be. You know, I went in with a 60 page lookbook, kind of just showing them, um, you know, everything, you know, um, sort of exactly what it would look and feel like. You know, I told them I wanted it to be on Animorphic 35 and talked about needing to shoot it in Athens, Georgia, and, um, you know, wanted specific actors, and they just. Instead of getting pushback, uh, they were just they embrace it all. They're like, "Yeah, let's do it." <laughs> I think I was trying to get them to like talk them out of wanting to work with me, but they just really embraced it. So it was great. I don't know. And like you know, by the end of this, this was like February, or March of 2012. By August, we were shooting down in Georgia. Wow. Yeah. It's fast. That's yeah. Like it's, fast turnaround. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't learn until last night when I was reading the press notes that you're from Athens. Yep. I went to undergrad there. Oh, nice! Um, Where'd you, did you live in Brumby ever? Or you... No, I lived in Payne Hall. Okay. And then I was in a sorority, so I lived in my Millage. Ooh. <laughs> which, which sorority? Alpha Gamma Delta. Alpha Gamma Delta. Okay. And one of our chapter advisors actually on Facebook uh, said that she remembered you from high school at Cedar Shoals. Whoa! Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, Cedar Shoals is a new room. Wow, very small. So world. I didn't know this. So I feel like I need to go back and watch this. Yeah. I mean, why did I mean you're from there, but yeah. why did you want to shoot it in Athens? Well, I've always wanted to make a movie in Athens, um, and then my first feature, Off the Black, which I made about six years ago, I had written to shoot even in parts of Athens, but Georgia didn't have a tax incentive then, so mm -hmm. it was financially impossible for us to shoot there. Um, and then when I read this script, it to me, it just shouted out as like, oh my god, this, this is Athens. Um, I mean, Tim Tharp's book takes place in Oklahoma, where he lives. And if the book had really wrestled with a lot of very regional issues, like if it was about kids that wanted to be bull riders or something. <laughs> yeah. I, I, would, I wouldn't reset a joke. I would have said, you know what, this is an Oklahoma story. Yeah. Um, but in this case, what was what it felt like was that it was not New York or L.A. It wasn't the middle of nowhere. It was kids, to someone else who hadn't grown up in a college town, I might read as vaguely suburban, but it had a feel to me in the way that breaking away, you know, feels yeah. like if you know Bloomington, Indiana, and Indiana University, you can kind of figure it out. But for other people, that could just be any number of places. Um, and Athens, Athens is amazing. It's really, you know, it's a college town. It's an artistically su just supportive town. Yeah. There's a great indie rock scene going back to B fifty two as an REM. Yeah. Georgia now has a really, really fantastic incentive. So, um, and I have a relationship with a lot of people there. Yeah. So I mean, my promise to everyone on the film was like, you're gonna have the best summer of your life. Like people will bend over backwards to help us here, mm -hmm. and we'll have a film that doesn't look like every other film that goes and shoots in Vancouver or someplace like that. Yeah. <laughs> So, awesome. Yeah. Was Jennifer Jason Lee a, 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 a throwback? I mean, did you find, choose her because of her involvement in those early movies? Um, it was, I mean, Jennifer Jason Lee is, I think, one of the best actresses alive. You know, I can tell you like a half dozen of my favorite performances. But yeah, I mean, she was the star of Fast on the Ridgemont High. Like, it doesn't it doesn't get much better than that. I mean, I love Cameron Crowe. And it was one of those things, I mean, I didn't want it to feel meta. You know, it's not, it's not sort of <laughs> winking at the audience. But I think it's one of those things where it's, you know, hopefully she feels completely believable as, as Sutter as our main character's mom, and she gives a great performance. And and yeah, if you happen to be a fan of that movie, you realize that it's our way of acknowledging acknowledging the lineage and respect for films that we admire. Well, it's funny because these, I mean, there are a couple of these movies now, 
in the last couple of years that are kind of throwbacks to those old movies. But I think that these new, mo- new movies, like your movie and like The Perks of Being a Wallflower mm-hmm. last year, I think they're way better. <laughs> I really do. I do. I think those movies were fantastic for their yeah. time, and yeah. they have things that we know we all connect yeah. with. But these movies are much more. They feel much more real and much more organic, and the characters feel like people that I can really, really relate to. Yeah. And I think that that's. I mean, it's an argument between <laughs> older and younger generations, but I think that a lot of the new movies that people like yourself are making really are taking what they loved and bringing something new into it that feels fresher. Yeah. And I, I'm happy about that. I'm glad you guys need to keep this up. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> With all respect to the memory of John Hughes and Kim. <laughs> We're awesome. They're all awesome. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was a different time then. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, now, uh, studios seem to, at least with the whole independent thing over the last, you know, 15, 20 years, really embrace movies that are grounded in reality. And people like yourself and, you know, the screenwriters here, and the same thing with Perks, realize that they can make movies about these periods of time that still have the comedy, yeah. that still are, you know, like, you can connect with these characters, but they feel real, yeah. you know? And I, that's that's better. It yeah. just is better. I, I, I like it. <laughs> To kind of piggyback on the reality of it, yeah. alcoholism has been in three of your films. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. oh. it's a major portion of your films. Can you talk about how to, you know, how you tackle that subject, and do you ever fear that you go too far in allowing characters to, especially in his character, is do you do you ever want to step back and say, you know, we have to have you kind of have a little bit stronger fall because of the actions you're going through, the choices you're making in the movie? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, I mean, for myself, I always operate from a place of almost like uh, the way I, I think a documentarian would approach character, not not necessarily in the filmmaking itself, but, you know, I try to not judge the characters, I try to not make them look like jerks, I try to be a great advocate for them, you know, and I try to try to depict them in such a way that if they were real people and their families were seeing this depiction of them, where they would feel like I'd given them a fair shake, you know. Um, coming from a place of real agency, and where I, I really am rooting for all of these characters, um, you know, so that's really where I come from. I don't really like films that are, you know, morality tales or that judge or that are social issue movies, you know, and first and foremost it's about an issue. I think issues should be entrenched in characters and relationships and, 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 and story. So, you know, I have never met a person who is a completely clean slate, who has everything figured out, who doesn't, you know, who just can get through, de- you know, their day and, like, they're loved perfectly by their parents and have a great relationship with their parents and with their wife and their kids and it's all great. Like, I've seen some bad um, studio movies where those, are, where those are some facsimile of real people, but those aren't any of the people that I've ever met. And I guess sort of, you know, the scar tissue of life um, and sort of the elaborate system of coping mechanisms that we create for ourselves to to try to get through, you know, our day-to-day life are kind of really fascinating to me. That's that's more fascinating to me than story in some cases. Like, for me, it's I'd rather just watch a really interesting character than to watch a really cheesy story. Hopefully you have a good story and a really complicated character. Well, it definitely, it made him seem so much more real. I, yeah. was, I was drawn to him immediately. It's like, I know this kid. Yeah. And he was, <laughs> everybody else like that. I didn't know he was the kid that was dancing in Footloose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nicole Kidman, which is heavy drama. Like yeah. he's got that that amazing he's range. So, oh, yeah, just astonishing. Yeah, no, he's a phenomenal actor. He's both of them are going to be big, big stars. They're great. He's, he's a cut up because he. I went. I saw. I went to the Divergent press conference uh-huh. and uh, Comic Con, uh-huh. and he was a cut up the entire time. <laughs> Ten of them up there. Well, uh, so you know, and I'm just like, oh my god. Yeah, he's, he's pretty. That's that's mom. It's hard to take your eyes off him, but he also has a lot of soulfulness, and he's like a really subtle actor, and like, yeah. and you know, and he, he knows real pain, and like, he's, you know, but yes, he is probably. One of the absolute most charismatic people I've ever met in my life. Yeah. What about casting for Mary Elizabeth? Because you had her in Smash was oh, she was phenomenal. Yeah. And what about she toned it down, but she still has that one emotional scene that just like oh, it's really it great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's great. I mean, I love like for me, it's like I would just never put an actor in a movie that I didn't love. You know what I mean? Like as a film goer, who I or you know from TV or film, 
I just watch so much stuff, and there's so many actors that I want to work with, I just think they're, they make everything they're in better. And they make dramatic scenes, they add levity to it, to humor scenes, they add gravity. Like, I just, um, so some, Mary is one of those actors where it's like, yeah, she was perfect for that part. Like, and it's so different than Smash, and it was fun to sort of just be her partner and sort of helping create that character and making someone that I think is different, you know, than, than her character in Smash. So, I mean, I hope at some point to work with all of these actors again, you know, whether it's the next film or three or four films, if I'm lucky. <laughs> down, down the road, I'm wishful thinking. Um, yeah. So you said you're not interested in social issues movies yet. Um, you are <laughs> about to make Rodham, yeah. right? Uh, so uh, I can't not ask a question about yeah. that with all the controversy today yeah. with Reince Priebus saying he's not going to let NBC and yeah. CNN yeah. You know, do debates over yeah. it. So um, what is it that interests you about Hillary, Hillary Clinton? Um, what interests me about you know this screenplay, which is, it's not a screenplay that I wrote, you know, mm-hmm. a guy named Young Kim wrote it, and was that it's not a cradle to the grave biopic. Most most of those, you know, that start when they're five and, they're, and, and they see a spider, and then like it cuts to seventy five. Like to me, they're so reductive, and it's like trying to compress an entire human life into two hours. Yeah. I find to be like a highlight reel of a life, yeah. and I get no emotional investment in it. In this case, like the story is a very, very specific um, time in her life in the early '70s. You know, a couple years out of Yale, Yale Law, when she was, you know, part of this kind of rock star group of, you mm-hmm. know, bi- intentionally bipartisan group of around, you know, 50 lawyers that John Doerr oversaw, but very intentionally Republican, Democrat, who were yeah, she was a Goldwater girl. She was a Goldwater girl, yeah, yeah. and and um, <laughs> and she was paired up mostly with Bill Weld, who became the Republican governor of Massachusetts. Right. But they were trying to create a legal foundation with which they could impeach Richard Nixon after after Watergate. And, you know, it wasn't partisan. It wasn't, you know, there was a breach of justice in the White House. In fact, it was probably more of an imperative for Republicans to make sure that he was brought to justice because he gave a bad name to Republicans. Right. But the story's really about her at 25, 26, like, balancing this career, being, she was one of only three female lawyers there, mm-hmm. you know, balancing this this world where there's a huge amount of gender inequality with her relationship with her boyfriend, Bill, who was in <laughs> Arkansas. <laughs> you know, starting to run for office. So for me, it was like... It didn't even matter that this is a portrait of young people who had become famous. It's actually about a young, brilliant, driven woman who's choosing between love and career. And it's a story about the sacrifices that any relationship, you know, that couples are always asked to make, but definitely women are always asked to make. Right. Um, so it's a character study. Um, it's not It's not a partisan film. It's not trying to get someone elected. It's not trying to be a hit job. I, I could care less. Like, people... There's so much attention because she's a, obviously a very famous figure who's people, probably running for president. Yeah, and I, people people like want to talk about like Lewinsky or Whitewater or like Benghazi. It's like I could care less. Our movie, the moment that Nixon stepped down, our movie's over. Right. So it's like have fun telling those stories. I don't want to engage with it. And honestly, an op-ed piece in the paper is better to engage with it. But did, did I mean Young? Did he write the script? I mean, obviously he. I, isn't writing the script as a partisan thing. Yeah. But I think the reason for at least the people on the Republican side that it's all convenient is that it's all going to be coming out, you know, like so close to elections. Yeah. Um, is your movie shooting for, you know, like 2014, 2015 to come out or? I mean, the hope I think is like, you know, Young wrote this script, it wound up on the blacklist, you know, at the end of last year, like mm-hmm. the best unproduced screenplays. Um, and it's fantastic script, you know, it was the first draft slowly been, I mean, he's kind of rewriting it, kind of slowly going through through it with him to make it as good as it could possibly be. Right. And it has all the burdens of any movie where it has to be, a, you know, you have to be emotionally invested in real characters, and then it's going to be scrutinized by the political right and oh, the left. Yeah. So it has that, but I mean, I would hope that we would shoot in the next year to year and a half. I mean, I think that's all of our hope, like if everything comes together, yeah, and then when it comes out, I and mean, then there's a lot of other things that are totally beyond our control. Right. But well, um, I'm looking forward to it because I mean she's a fascinating figure. That should be the thing. Yeah, there's a reason why nobody talks about any uh, anybody else being the next president right now. Definitely. I mean the way I see it is like sort of a good a, for me at least a good biopic. If that's feels almost like a dirty dirty term, but that makes it <laughs> teen film is a dirty term too for a lot yeah. of people. So it's like it can be really good. Well, um, you're doing it from in the same respect that they just did Lincoln. That was the brilliant thing about Lincoln. Good luck. Good luck. You know, yeah, Mel. Good luck. Whatever. Yeah. Um, for me, it's so almost like that rule that you hear about science fiction and horror movies, where it's like if for them to be to really work and really resonate, they should work even if you remove that supernatural element. Right. You know what I mean? Like or Blade Runner. It's sci-fi, but at the end of the day, it's just a film noir. Kind of yeah. Thing. You know what I mean? So it's like it really needs to work regardless of whether she went on to become a public figure. You know? Yeah. That's what my dad said about Brokeback Mountain. Think about it if they took the gay out. <laughs> <laughs> the 
Nathan. It's still work, Nathan. Yeah, I think it's a good movie. Yeah, it's a great, great, great movie, guys. Great, whatever. It's a great story. Yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to How, it. How, what was, uh, I, I mean, I saw this with one of my girlfriends, and immediately when the lights went back up, it was, I love that she had no makeup on. Yeah. I mean, was that your choice or was her choice? Or and it wasn't even no makeup look. It was no makeup. Yeah. And I think that's going to make a huge impression on any kids that see this movie. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it was part of the design that I wanted for all the actors. I mean, Miles doesn't either. You know, um, like the actors don't. And it was part of the earliest conversations that I had with the actors before they were cast was, hey, the goal here is not to do an approximation of of adolescence. It's sort of, in many ways, it's, it's to really be what adolescent life is like for a lot of people in public high schools in Georgia or Texas or mm-hmm. Illinois or wherever, um, where you don't go to school with a bunch of Abercrombie and Fitch models wearing skinny jeans who are perfectly made up, who have yeah. cheekbones, you know? Um, and I don't want to perpetuate, like, stereotypes or just false notions of beauty or masculinity that are totally warped that make kids hate themselves. Uh, yeah. Honestly, uh, I want to make a movie that people like and can see themselves in. Um, yeah. Because there's always that arm's length distance when you feel like, God, I'll never look like that. Yeah. It's like, no, that's, I don't think that's how you make a film that gets its hooks in you and draws you in. So, you know, yeah, I talked to Miles and Shailene and all the actors about that from early on, and they were totally gung ho, like 100%. Yeah. I mean, they couldn't have, I mean, Shailene and Miles are brilliant actors, great dramaturgs, they understood these kids. They didn't want to do that either. I mean, it was it was awesome. I mean, like, yeah. Miles, like, neither of them had ever done a sex scene before, so they were really nervous about it. We talked about it endlessly, so they knew exactly, you know, how we would do it, and they were comfortable with it. And I remember Shailene was like, Miles, you better not work out. I want you to have a beer gut. You <laughs> and I was like, I gotta have a six pack! She's like, no, no, she wouldn't let him work out. I was like, no, they were, like, there's no vanity. Like, they're really, yeah. really intelligent. You know, the same, it's the same approach that, like, a really smart much older act that I'm sure Jack Nicholson would bring to a performance or Kate Winslet or whomever pick, pick the adult actor like really great actors have great careers I think are great dramaturgs they pick the right roles they pick the right scripts and they pick you know roles that they know they can do something to. they know the challenges of it and how they can hit it out of the park mm-hmm. Miles and Shailene are at the beginning of the career but they have those instincts and part of that is just fierce intelligence a dedication to honesty and no vanity so they were great I mean they were yeah. collaborators and I learned from them I'm sure there was a lot less time in the makeup Really. Yeah, I mean, to, to be sure, with all respect to our hair and makeup, we did have hair and makeup departments, and it was a lot of it was. I mean, you, inevitably, you need that on set, like yeah. to maintain continuity, things like that. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it was for for everyone. I think it was like just very stripped down. Right? I think yeah. almost they might have thought it was like, does this guy, like this poor independent filmmaker, think that we can't afford makeup? <laughs> <laughs> or There's like, no. I wouldn't think that, you, but you I know, don't know. But it is. But it's a very different approach than you know, like in it we shot in Athens, Georgia. There's a lot of shows that shoot in Atlanta, you know, um, Vampire Diaries, mm-hmm. Teen Wolf, was there one of the move, Walking Dead, movies, you know, and a lot of, like, studio comedy shoot there, yeah. which would have a more traditional look. Uh, yeah. So I think this was a little different for everyone, maybe. But everyone supported it. it was yeah, great. it was awesome. What about having female leads? I mean, you've had kind of back-to-back movies where females are the strong point, even though Miles technically is probably leading this. Yeah. What do you see in young actresses, or how do you work with Shailene and, and Mary Elizabeth to... Mary Elizabeth, to, to figure out what they want to bring to the, the character. I mean, you, now you're doing Hillary. I mean, you could go on a theme here where you could be one of the best young actresses George in the country. Cooper, yeah. George, yeah. That's George Cooper, the, the, the minster yeah. um, Not to label you, but yeah, no, you do I mean, a good job of it. Listen, I love my wife, I love my sister, I love my mom. <laughs> I have a lot of really strong, brilliant women around me who I... The best thing I can do is just listen to them, <laughs> um, and they are right. <laughs> Nine out of ten. Um, you grew up in a house of women. <laughs> no, um, I, uh, you know, I, I treat actors as collaborators. I mean, I sort of make a promise to them at the beginning of any shoot, like that. A, like my real work was in casting the right person, not the wrong person. And then once I cast the right person, part of that has come from. You know, I've, if someone's going to be like a lead in a film I've made, I probably have been moved by them in some previous film. So I respect them as artists, and I know what they're capable of. And they've given me some take. They've talked to me about their take on this character, and it inspires, expands, and probably obliterates my preconceived notions about the character, where it's like, yeah, that's so much better than anything I imagined. And then at that point, it's just about getting on the same page about individual things in scenes, and just like, well, what exactly is this scene about? And... And if the actor feels like, you know what, actually I think this scene is subpar, or it could, you know, I would never say this, I listen to them. I just tell them off the bat, we will, anything you want to try in front of the camera, we will shoot. 
Um, you just have to agree to try anything that I ask, and it's a collaboration, and uh, we're partners on this. So it's that, it's just respect. What about the father character? There's, I mean, especially with him, he's played such great dads. So yeah. Kyle Chandler, and you I throw love. Kyle kind of a role that he's not redeemable. Yes. Yeah. What was that experience with him like? It was awesome. I mean, it's it's a really supporting roles are always tough. They can be really fun because they can be the most colorful characters. But it can be tough, especially if you're a character who's like talked of, spoken of, conceptualized by like a main character, where they almost create a negative space in the movie. You basically have this kid who has this false kind of warped notion of masculinity. He's kind of quasi deified this absent father figure and marvel himself after it. And in many ways that I think that like American pop culture probably has, we've lived kind of in the shadow for what, 15, 20 years now at least, if not longer, of like main, mainstream studio comedies that are all about like a 45 year old guy who parties like he's 20 and whoa, that's crazy. Yeah. And it's like, and like my young cousins like worship those movies, college guys everywhere, love those guys. I love those, I'm not like a sick in the mud, I love those movies. But I think in real life, like, if you were raised by that guy and he abandoned your mom and you when you were nine, if you were married to that guy or dated that guy and he was just a drunk or a womanizer or an addict or an abuser or whatever, just a narcissist, it sucks. You know, it really sucks. And I wasn't particularly interested in glorifying that character, but I think a lot of movies before this have and have had a, a really latent strain, strain of chauvinism in them. And this is a kid that's on a fast track to becoming that guy. So when that character shows up in the movie, you know, he's thought about, and this kid even like, kind of resents his mother because he thinks that she's responsible yeah, yeah. for him leaving, um, you know, and when in fact she's been protecting him. It's almost, I think of it like an airplane taking off. Like, you want, like, a running, at least, like, you want a running start to meeting that character, which is to say, when that door opens, like, and we, the audience, and this kid get to finally meet this dad who he's been thinking about, longing for, you don't want the audience, you know, if you cast... I don't know, like Crispin Glover, <laughs> or like Steve, or even Steve Buscemi, or any a number of actors, Willem Dafoe, actors who I love, but people would be like, whoa, like, but you know, when you cast like, um, you know, Kyle Chandler, like you bring in audiences for the most part, a lot of them for five years, once a week, had Coach Taylor in their living room. It's like he's like a Gary Cooper, Henry Fonda, greatest dad, greatest coach, and so like you can imagine like the way that this kid, because you, the audience, probably feel it. You can imagine how it'd be like. My dad is a cool dude, and ten minutes later, it's like your dad is not a cool dude, and he does not care about you, and it's all the more heartbreaking. It's like in a in a short span, I think it allows sort of a character arc that's much more dramatic. It works. Yeah, <laughs> people love Coach Taylor. You know? <laughs> yeah, Kyle. And Kyle's an awesome actor, and he's down to try anything. And I think like any great TV actor had a really definitive role. You know, like Gandolfini or Brian Cranston or whatever. Like they can really get pigeonholed as that character. So sometimes they have to work. You know, they, they kind of have to work against against type in some ways. So, um, but. it's the first chance he's had. I think he's been in some other things, and it's been yeah. He's been fun. he played a similar kind of role in Super Eight. Mm -hmm. yeah. God, he was so good. At Super yeah, he's fun. And then he's played like a CI. You know, he's been in like Argo, Zero Thirty, stuff like that, where he's like you know a, a tough authoritative. Yeah, he's suit, in but, both of those last two. Um, yeah, good in both of them. But um, but yeah, I mean, he is a guy that for five years, like he was a guy. Would you let your kid hang out with Coach Taylor? Yeah, of course. This hurt. <laughs> no, not so much. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, I never saw that shit. Uh, it's really good. I know, I've been told by you. live in Texas. You have to choose, like, there. there's so many shows to watch. That's like, one of the good ones, it man. It survived, too. It kept staying on, you know. <laughs> it did. I yeah. saw the movie. What are your, I guess to wrap this up, what are your hopes for this movie? Man, my hopes are that the movie gets discovered and seen. We obviously, like, I mean... You know, in theaters. Um, yeah. But, right. I mean, it's a like, limited release right now, but it's, you know, opening wider. Yeah. I mean, it's like we'll never have the marketing budget. We can't carpet bomb the world with billboards and TV spots yeah. <laughs> and, and make people just, you know, we can't be the Coca-Cola Nike logo that you can't escape, you know, of movies. Yeah. Like, it's a movie that really requires good word of mouth. Yeah. You know what I mean? From festival screenings, from Twitter, from whatever. For people that see it and tell their friends about it. Those are the best movies. When they work, when you feel like you've discovered it, when you feel like someone has told you something because it's good, not because they're genuinely trying to sell you something. Mm -hmm. I think that's all of our hope for. We really, I mean, everyone involved in the movie believes in it. I mean, last weekend, this weekend, like, me and the writers will be out doing Q&As in different cities around yeah. the country. The actors have really promoted it. Like, we all believe in it. And, um, and, want to see, and personally, as a film goer, I want to see more movies like this, and I want oh, to see yeah. studios make movies like this. Um, and I think if it can be successful, they will. And it's, you know, it just comes down to that. If it makes money, 
um, and people see an opportunity to make money off movies like this, they will make more movies like this that realistically depict teenagers that respect their emotional inner lives where they don't have to have superpowers or be vampires or werewolves. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they have. And this summer has shown, I mean, with Kings of Summer, Mud, yep. this movie, yep. I mean, they've really, they've done it, and those have been most of the better movies of this year. Yep. So, I mean, yeah. Back to reality. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see, we'll see what studios are making in the next two years. Like, and it's the same thing with adults. Yep. I mean, in the yeah. and, and children. I mean, I, I, the opening of Before Midnight. I don't know if you saw Before Midnight yet, but... I've seen it three times. The interviewed Link later at South. <laughs> love the movie. Yeah, love it. yeah that oh, opening love scene, it. as a father, I watch it and I'm like, I almost cried just in the first ten minutes. Like, I was like, oh... <laughs> I mean that movie, man. Yeah, yeah. that guy's a genius, and the, the, yeah. those movies are like a gift. I think. Yeah, I, I agree. Well, thank you so much. Oh, thank so you so much. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's tight. Don't even try to bite the side. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game, and it feels alright.